Yeah. So your grandpa started this in the town of Mayville. Mm -hmm. uh, 1942. It's uh, essentially as a soda and burger shop. Mm -hmm. Kind of like the old school uh, paper hats, white t-shirt, or white button-down shirt. And, um, and then from there, he actually, uh, he was drafted into the Army, and he was in Patton's Third Army. And he was actually in the um, European theater and fought in all the major battles. And uh, lucky, for, lucky for us, lucky for me, lucky he for survived, our family, yeah. he, he came out on the other side. And, wow. And, uh, and then he actually, um, then when he came back, uh, one of the first things he did was he purchased a, a barn, uh, which was a carriage barn in the back, uh, behind where the existing found net was. Mm -hmm. And he ended up um, going ahead and starting to make candy there. And it was a dirt floor uh, barn and then started to make candy. And the big thing that they started to do is they made uh, all day suckers, which were a really large sucker. Um, and they used to take that to all the fairs. And, it's and like the quintessential mid-century, like, right? Mm -hmm. It's all day, not because it's special. It's not like gobs, everlasting gobstopper. Exactly. <laughs> it's just the size of the thing, right? Right. It's this big circle. Yeah, so it should take you all day to eat it. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, so, and then from there, um, they started to um, actually have different stands that they put up where they would sell goat milk fudge and then uh, some of them where they actually sold burgers and different things like that and they had them all mm -hmm. along 5 and 20, route 5 yep. and 20. And, um, and then uh, as, the, as things started to change, they went ahead and changed and expanded their business. And then they kind of came to the conclusion that having all of these little units all over the place wasn't the, wasn't the best way to do sure. it that the best thing to do was to go ahead and focus all their efforts on one spot. And uh, in the exact timeline, I'm not positive of, but um, somewhere in the, in the 50s, uh, right around 58, I think, is when they purchased the existing site that uh, wow. Webb sits on now. And, uh, and that was a, a gamble. It was a farm, and there was a lot of swamp land on it. And this? This. So this is right across from the lake. Mm -hmm. And at that time, the road was probably one single lake. I mean, it's is like 50, so. Yeah. And it, it was probably, it might have, I think it was two lanes back then. But tourism was still happening, right? Or, Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so the tourism industry in the area really started uh, in the 1800s, in the late 1800s. And uh, the stories that I've been told is that essentially, the railroads kind of created this as a destination. And okay, the, which was happening region-wide into these peripheral, rural environments. Exactly. You know, people are coming out from the city, spending the weekend. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I often wonder now, were you getting in that era the same tourism? Like, were you getting Pittsburgh Absolutely. and parts west? Because mm -hmm. parts west was just, you know. Well, it, so as, as far as the... Webb's business, we definitely, um, throughout our experience, we've gotten, Buffalo's been a big market for us. Uh, the Cleveland area certainly has been a tremendous market for us in the mm -hmm. Pittsburgh area, and then kind of everything that fills in the gaps in between. And, um, and so as that started to move forward in the, in the late 50s, this was purchased here. And right. then uh, the existing facility where the sign is, that was the original sign. And that there was actually just a little diner here that uh, used to be called the Mooring Bit, which was a nautical play. Okay. Uh, so like mooring lines, and and it actually sat right across from the marina. The marina existed right uh, back then as well. Wow. And um, so, and then they just kind of continued to go ahead and expand, and grow the business. And uh, they had a souvenir shack. And then they also had the, the mooring bit, and that's kind of how things got started on this site down here. And then uh, from there, um, they went ahead and um, moved the candy business down here, um, and then they started to get a little bit more into the restaurant business. So it was like a slow consolidation. It was. And just it, it's over that decade, perhaps the 50s, where it just slowly 50s integrated. 50s and into the... Yeah, so probably over about the next uh, 10 to 15 years, that's when that really started to you wow. know, really expand. So, you know, this is a classic story. And what I love about your business is the timeline. Because in our day now, 
everything's so hurried and nobody has any patience. And I grew up in a small entrepreneurial business, a restaurant, and it takes a long time. And you have to be patient and you mm -hmm. have to see things through and you're gonna go through your cycles. And here we are, you know, how many years later? And just even the initial consolidation of the various attributes of the business had to get here. And you know, your grandpa had to see that through. Mm -hmm. And that's not an easy process. He had to figure all that out. This is all empty farmland swamp. But it's amazing to see how this business has grown and changed over the years and hear these stories. And it's important to tell the story, mm -hmm. you know. So now we're in the 50s. Things are now consolidated into this one building, right? Mm -hmm. And bowling alley, is that in the 50s? Uh, I believe that was in the early 60s. Early 60s. Uh -huh. So that was kind of like after you've now established this, your grandpa was like, now what do we need? Yeah. Your grandmother must have been like, look, <laughs> well, <laughs> right? Well, they have, a, they have a pretty interesting history as well. They were both in their own right. They had, uh, like grandmother actually um, in high school was a really good dancer, tap mm -hmm. dancer, and, and uh, she actually got offered uh, an audition by the Rockettes to go to Whoa, New York City. Oh, yeah, that's a big deal. Back then, that was even bigger than now. Yeah, and so it was, uh, it was huge. It was, you know, it was amazing. And so she had that opportunity to go and to do that. And, uh, and her parents at the time uh, refused to let her go. Because she was just a kid, sure, right? They didn't want her going to the big city and getting swept up and all that. And, right. and so they, they wouldn't let her go do that. Um, and, and is this while your grandpa was off to war? Same era? Well, so when they, were, when they were both growing up in their high school years, my grandfather was actually a really good baseball player. Mm -hmm. And uh, and there was a, long story short, there was a professional scout that had moved into the area mm -hmm. and uh, and he put together a team, an all-county team, mm -hmm. and uh, they ended up going down and playing the Chautauqua Institution team, which was made up of a bunch of college uh, kind of all-stars, uh -huh. and, uh, and that was at the tail end of as that you know, kind of corporate baseball was going on sure, and everything. Sure. And, uh, and so every, they ended up doing real well against the Chautauqua team that they weren't supposed to be able to do well right, anything against, against at all. Yeah. And uh, they did real well. And actually every single one of those kids that was on that team ended up getting offered uh, uh, a wow, trial for to join a the majors? baseball team. And so he actually got a trial for the St. Louis Cardinals. Holy cow. And then he got drafted. And, uh, and then at the same time, my uh, grandmother had gotten offered a, a tryout for the Rockettes, and they both went to Little Mayville High School, you know, where there wow. were probably 30 kids in a yeah, class. Yeah, you know, and the back most. then, too. I yeah. mean, you know, this is, yeah. that's a Big monster deal. deal. And think about life and synchronicity and synergy. Like, if yeah. they had said, you know what, you should go to New York, I should go here, we shouldn't lose these opportunities. Yeah. This whole, it's like back to the future. Yeah. When things start disappearing, you know, yeah. you're like, what happened? Yeah. <laughs> wow. And so, so for them, you know, they both had these, you know, kind of, kind of near misses, so to speak, at these, you know, unbelievable paths. And so then as they came back, for them to, I think getting into business, you know, was, was sort of their way to... Stay together? To stay together. And then also, though, in their own way, see a new dream and pursue a new dream and kind of their, what ended up being their American dream. They had the candy making business. They had just uh, made a major investment into the restaurant business at that time, which was the captain's table, which it still is. And then, uh, and then also the the bowling alley. And so then you had these three different businesses that were kind of lined up, which ironically is you know as you see like a mixed use facility will have, where they will have commercial on the bottom and then apartments or condos on top. They try to make those places look different. You know, sure. The, the three. <laughs> right, right, right. So, and then their whole focus was to go ahead and to try to m not make it look different, to make it look like it was one cohesive <laughs> business. And so they worked very hard to do that. You know? Right. And so then that's kind of, you know, you that progression is, you know, what you see now, where it, you know, it's it's clear that it's all, you know, one building. one, you, yeah, entity and right. It's empowering to, to us as a family because then you start to understand and realize that it's a matter of. You know, what what can you do? Sure. What can you what you could can, do anything. Right. Right. And just uh, just kind of really, you know, lean forward and and work with everybody that you can to try to do something positive. And you know, one of the sayings that we've always had 
is that uh, you're only as good as your last meal. Yep. And, uh, and as long as you don't forget that, uh, then, you know, I think you'll be all right. Uh, the project is a 55,000 square foot luxury condominium hotel that sits right down on Lakeshore Drive next to the Chautauqua Bell. Um, it's four and a half stories. It has 27 residential units that would average uh, about 1,150 square feet. Uh, they're one, two, three bedroom plus one 2,000 square foot penthouse. The units are fully furnished, full kitchens. Right down to knives, forks, spoons, linens. Uh, there's a front desk operation with uh, valet, bell service, concierge, daily housekeeping, room service, uh, two restaurants, uh, a full restaurant and uh, bar that's off the lobby, and then a, a wine bar and tapas, uh, which is up on the, the fifth floor overlooking the lake. Third floor pool and hot tub fitness center, a uh, few spa treatment rooms, guest laundry. The view from every unit, uh, you know, there are oversized decks or patios and it has expansive views of the, right down the North Basin of the lake. So every single unit will have unobstructed, amazing lake views. Uh, it'll be super high end. The four star amenities and services will allow us to attract a group of people who are looking for extreme convenience. They basically show up, you know, they check in and out like a hotel. Um, they have all these services available to, that, to them and they have no obligation to own. You know, they show up, we take care of everything. They walk away, uh, you know, with the unit dirty, it's cleaned. You know, they can rent it in an optional rental program on the times that they're not here and they receive a percentage back to them monthly and uh, we also sell it in two different formats. You can buy it as a conventional whole ownership condominium, or you can also buy it as a one-sixth fractional interest, which means they each fractional owner would own every sixth week forever. So within a six-week period, you have one Friday to Friday. Four out of six years, you get nine weeks. Two out of six years, you get eight weeks. But after six years, the cycle starts again. So theoretically, each fractional owner gets one of all 52 weeks in a six-year period because the weeks, they, they change. So everybody gets a 4th of July week, everybody gets a Labor Day week, a Christmas week, so it all averages. And then we have a program which works great for people who are a little bit more flexible. It's called Space Available. The other 42 or 43 weeks a year you wouldn't own, any time the facility is under 90% occupied, you can call three days before check-in and stay in your unit or a comparable unit at no additional cost. That was great, and Ben and I talked about that. That's yeah. such a great business model. Well, what it does is it promotes owners to come on off-peak times, sure. which help power our profit centers, the restaurants, you know, the services keeps housekeeping staff on a more regular basis. And it, and it allows them to leave their more of their peak times in the rental program, which means that they're more, uh, have more cash flow. The operating company, which will be Ben's company, basically has more units to rent during the peaks. So everybody wins. Yeah, that's, I've never heard of that.